Okay, this is Mishle 11.4. Uh, okay, and if it sounds familiar, it's because we've done one that sounds very much like it. Lo yo il hon biom evra utstaka tatiam limaves. Anyone want to try translating? I, I actually put all of the unknown words here. So I'll go through them and then I'll ask if anyone wants to try translating. So yo yo il is to me, it means to benefit, to profit, to avail, um, to gain profit. Okay, like to LS. So that's yo il. Hone is wealth or sufficiency. Usually I think it's a lot of wealth. Um, uh, and then Evra is the hardest one to translate. Evra means overflow. I don't know what that, what's up with that. Arrogance, fury is the one that I've heard of usually. Overflow, excess, outbursts, excess of, uh, of insolence, arrogance, overflowing, rage, fury. I, I've only really heard about rage. So I don't know where they're getting this overflow or fury from. So Hoyle, benefit, hone, wealth, Evra, fury, rage. So now that I gave you all the words that we don't know, then anyone want to try translating? <laughs> No one. Lo yo eel. You can like look at the definition right here. I got all night, people. <laughs> game. Say again. I said no game. No gain. Okay, good. That's a start. Okay. Uh, hone. Wealth. So how do you put that together? Is it? No wealth is gained. Okay. No wealth is gained. Okay. So that's one way to do it. No wealth is gained. Okay. What would be another way to do it? They won't gain well or one won't gain well. Uh, one will not gain wealth. What's another way to do it? Wealth cannot be gained, maybe. <laughs> no, see, at least you guys are trying, okay? Because it really is the one that no one is saying, which is, and I think all those are, are uh, I don't know anyone who says that. Lo yo il hon, hon is the subject. Okay, so wealth will not uh, benefit. I'm just going to use benefit because gain sounds weird. Wealth will not gain. Uh, wealth will not benefit. Biom Evra. On a day of fury. Utsdaka tati mimavis. There are two ways to translate that. And like charity saves someone from death. Okay, good. From death. All right. So charity is one way to translate tzedakah. What would the, be the other way to, to translate uh, tzedakah in Mishle other than charity? Like righteousness? Yeah, righteousness. Okay. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because we had a pasuk, the very second pasuk we did in this uh, series, Mishle 10.2, lo yo ilu otros resha ut tzedakah tasimimavis. And although we're not going to analyze that pasuk, a lot of the mafarshim are bothered by the seeming redundancy because it was just like, you know, a parak ago. So, um, so I'm going to translate it anyway. Okay. Uh, oops. Yeah. 10 to lo yo ilu otros resha. So, uh, treasuries of wickedness, wickedness will not benefit. Um, but, uh, charity slash righteousness saves from death. Okay, so just we're, we're again, we're not going to analyze that, but just keep it in mind um, for returning to later. Okay, so let oops, sorry, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do what we always try to do. Save this as a separate documents. Notes. Okay, analysis notes. Okay, so now we can delete this. We can delete that. We can delete that. Sadigon says, Lo yo il hahon biom hadin. Okay, so he translates this as yom hadin okay uh, uh wealth will not benefit on judgment day okay and if you're wondering where he gets that from um it's because there is i only know this from the meiri oh sorry not the meiri the uh the malvim okay uh there's a puzzle in safania 
Okay, let me show you. So Tzfanya, uh, Aleph Yudalad through Tesvav says, Karov Yom Hashem Hagadol. Uh, the great day of Hashem is close. Umaher Ma'od. And it's, uh, it's, I guess it's coming very quickly. Kol Yom Hashem Mar Tzoreach Sham Gibor. I'm not exactly sure how to, how to translate these words, but the, the sound of the day of Hashem is bitter, Tzoreach, whatever that is. Yom Evra, okay, the day of, of fury, Hayom Hahu, uh, so it will be a day of, of fury. Yom Tsara, a day of distress. Umutsuka, and a day of, of uh, catastrophe. Yom Shoah, a day of burning. Umushoa, I don't know what the difference between Shoah and Meshoah is. Yom Choshech Vafela, a day of darkness and, uh, and uh, gloom. Yom Anan Varafel, a day of cloud and thick cloud. Okay, so pretty dire prophecy there, but that's referring to the, the judgment day at the time of Mashiach when the entire world will be judged. So that's probably where Sadio is getting it from. Okay. Uh, so it's not, so in other words, he's not translating Evra as judgment. He's saying, what is the day of wrath? It's referring to the day of judgment. Okay. Then Targum says something, two things very interesting. Okay. Lomahane Shikra, Bioma Durugza. Okay. Shikra, if you had to, if you, if you didn't know Aramaic, what would you guess Shikra is? Like lies and stuff? Yeah. Lies. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with the broader one, falsehood, but it's, lies is also good. L falsehood will not benefit on a day of wrath. Utstaka mafalta min mosa bisha. And uh, charity slash righteousness will save from a bad death. Okay, which is answering an obvious question. What's the obvious question that it's answering, which we, we're going to ask anyway? Like nothing can save you from death. Yeah, nothing saves you from death. He can't escape death, right? So obviously all the Mepharshim try to, 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 to cope with that. So, the, so he says a bad death. Okay, so let's look at Art Scroll. Art Scroll says, wealth will not avail in the day of wrath, but charity will rescue from death. Okay, that's pretty much the same thing that we, uh, we said. Um, actually, I, I do actually do a like avail. I like avail. I'm going to add avail because avail kind of has the connotation of helping like from a bad situation, um, as opposed to just like straight up profit or benefit. Um, uh, Living Knox says, wealth is of no avail on the day of wrath, but charity saves from death. Okay, it's the same thing. Alter says, wealth avails not on the day of wrath, but righteousness saves from death. Okay, same thing. Um, and let's just make this guy smaller so we can keep him out of our minds there. Okay, and now we get to the questions or problems. Uh, oh, uh, oh. One second. Was anyone here? Okay, good. No one was here. Who's in the shear? Who was here in my morning shear? So I, I get to repeat a story. Okay. Um, uh, so this is a story I heard um, from uh, from a Tim Ferriss podcast with this gourmet chef uh, who was also an ethnobotanist. Ethnobotanists are people who go and um, they like search out uh, you know, the, the uses of plants in like indigenous, uh, uh, tribes or like, you know, native populations. Okay. So there was this case, uh, where, oh, hold on a second. I just, uh, let me just actually read the exact case because I told it this morning without looking at the facts, without reviewing the facts. Okay. Give me one second. It's a good story. And then uh, it's a methodology point. That's where it's going. Okay. So, um, there was this guy, uh, this medicine man. Okay. I don't know where this was. I think it was in South America or something like that. Um, that they found, hold on. He made this concoction. Okay. That lowered blood glucose in type two diabetics, diabetics. Okay. So this is like in some, I don't know, primitive or at least some native population. Okay. And this medicine man, you know, the shaman or whatever, like would make this concoction and, uh, and like it, 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 it like they, they had a demonstration like it actually like lowered um blood glucose okay and like they they the scientists like measured it and saw like okay this is amazing so they asked the guy uh what can you please tell us what herbs you used because we want to do some more tests on this okay so he told them all the herbs um and so they 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 gathered all the herbs and they went to the lab and they like tra tried running the test and no matter what they could not replicate it okay like they tr they tried every single combination they they did exactly what he said and like they said okay maybe he told it to us in the wrong way so they did it in another order and then they like isolated compounds and nothing was working so they just didn't know what happened so they they went back to the guy and they said uh your concoction doesn't work okay and he said what do you mean it doesn't work you're the one who told me it works and they said yeah that's why we're confused too can you prepare it again 
and uh, and we'll watch you, and then we'll we'll see if like if you know what, what what you're doing differently. So he prepares it, and he takes all the herbs, and he like you know he crushes them, and he he boils them, and he like puts them together again, and then like towards the end of the process, he throws in a little crab. Okay, <laughs> like just a little crab. All right, and they're like, what? Wait, wait, what is that? And he said, it's the crab. And they're like, what do you mean it's the crab? <laughs> he's like, yeah. At the end, you throw in a little crab, and they're like, but you didn't tell us to put in a. a, a, a that's not how you told us to make it. Uh, you didn't tell us to put in a crab. And he said, yeah, I didn't tell you to put in a crab because you didn't ask. And they said, what do you mean we didn't ask? And he said, you asked me, what herbs do you use in your concoction? So I told you all the herbs, but this is a crab. <laughs> okay. So, so what, what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is you might not find the answer if you're not asking all the right questions. Okay. And this is why I insist in the first, I'd say, give it a good seven years of learning Michelet, give or take, where you force yourself to ask every question. Uh, and uh, you'll find that it will do wonders because there will be so many cases where if you had rushed through or if you hadn't like made sure that you asked all the questions, then you would have missed something that really led you to the answer. After you've done it like, you know, um, like for a very long time. So then you don't Always, I mean, still a good idea to list all the questions, but you don't necessarily need to. Like, again, my, my you know, uh, top Michelin Chabrusa uh, and I are at the point where, like, we're, we're telepathic. So, like, we don't need to, like, say the questions to each other. We, we, we know what the questions are. Uh, but, and we'll only say something if it's, like, an outstandingly, like, uh, um, new kind of question. So that's the methodology uh, story that I uh, told this morning, and I wanted to replicate it here because it's a fun story. Okay, so having said that, uh, what are the questions? Um, this may be premature, but the first question that came to mind is wealth will, whose wealth will not benefit a veil on a day of, and also again, you know, whose charity saves, saves, charity saves who from death? I mean, it's okay. Uh, okay. audience. Question. So whose wealth, I'm going to split these into two, um, to two questions. I'll show you why whose wealth will, um, will not avail. Okay. And the reason why this is, uh, so this is a good question on its own. But if you compare it to the original puzzle we did, it said specifically the wealth of a wicked person. So this is a, uh, uh, I'm going to point, incorporate this into the question. Okay. Last time it only talked about the wealth of a wicked person. And by the way, since no one, uh, well, I don't know if no one, but probably we don't remember what we said uh, last October when we learned 10-2. Uh, uh, so, um, so someone might have to go back and check, but I, I, would, I would venture to guess that we made the idea dependent on the Russia. And now this seems to be saying no wealth at all will help on a day of wrath. Okay, so that's a good question. And then the second question was, um, who's, um, who's Sadaka, okay, uh, will save from death? Uh, is this anyone's Sadaka? Okay, or what would be the other possibility maybe that you might think uh, about who's, uh, who's Sadaka? Maybe like yeah. Like it's Sadik. Yeah, it's Sadik, right? Okay, or or maybe only a certain, sorry, a certain type of person's sadaka. Okay, for example, a tzadik, or if we're going with the last pasuk that we did, or a yosher. Yeah. Okay. Good. Also, what's a day of fury, and what do we mean by death? Yeah, what is a slash the day of fury? And then what does death mean in this context? So, uh, and then we'll just list a few options uh, that we've seen so far, which is, is it literal death? Um, uh, so uh, let's do this. Is it A, literal death? B, a bad death? C, uh, any other candidates for what death might be? I know we're not, we don't usually answer at this time, but I feel like we've done enough soaking with death that like we might as well just uh, uh, get some options out of the way at least. Uh, metaphorical death. Yeah, metaphorical death. I think there is one more literal death that you can say that doesn't mean like biological death. Like sleeping? No. That would be, I think that would put you in your metaphor category. Save you from sleep. You just constantly give Sadaki, you're not going to sleep. <laughs> Was that for you to sleep? Because like you're, you're at like a really, really late hour right now. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe. 
<laughs> just give Sadaka and try it out. We'll see if that shot works. I mean, I have another question though. Okay, I mean, hold on. Just, uh, yeah, hold on for just one second. So the other death, which our interpretations don't usually do, uh, but death of the soul, okay, is one that um, that if you're talking about the soul, then the death of the soul would be like Karis or loss of Olam Haba, okay? Uh, and then E is something else. Oop, something else. Yeah, Ariel, what's the other question? Um, like who, who's day of fury exactly? Like, is it everyone's or is it just that one person or is it? Okay, so um, so I'm gonna add that to question three. Okay, what is the day of fury? Um, uh, who is subject to this day of fury? Is it personal, universal, something else, other? Yeah. And also, and, and if, and if also, it is universal, then like, sorry, if it is universal, so then the implication is that Sadaka is saving you from that day, of, that death from the day of fury. But if it's personal, so then like, it could be, you know, I don't know, it could be like day of fury is one thing and, and death is another thing. Yeah, Ariel? Um, and also, hold on, I just forgot my question. Sorry, that was my fault. I interrupted. Um, I'm just going to say Sorry, just give me one second. I'll just continue. I just okay. Anyone else have questions? Wait, just like on the day of fury part, mm -hmm. um, it would be like a logical thing to do to see where else that word is used. I don't remember if you like that approach or don't. So I, I, it's not that I don't um, think it's a good approach. I do think it is a good approach, um, but I typically don't like it because oftentimes if you find a ton of results, then you end up having to like, learn through everything we can try it though and just see what happens this is like i feel like it's a very very i feel like it's very religious like i know we're learning yeah i know yeah yeah right <laughs> yom evra all right let's see what happens uh hold on let me share the screen for all torah okay so yom evra there are uh i didn't do an exact search so let's see okay uh, nope, that's Avra. Okay, here's Yeshayahu. Hine yom Hashem ba achzari ve'evra v'charon af lasum ha'arts l'shama v'chata'eha yashmin mimena. So that means, behold, the day of Hashem is coming. Uh, I got to get the uh, Tamim here. Hine yom Hashem ba achzari ve'evra v'charon af. Cruelty, Wrath and a day of uh, of, ang of of burning anger. La sum arts la shama to make the earth, the land desolate. Vachata eha yashmi mimena, and its sinners will will be wiped out from upon it. Now I'm gonna I don't know this context in Yeshayahu Yud Gimel. I'm gonna assume it's the destruction of the base of Mikdash. Let's just see if anyone says that here. Um, uh, Rashi. If I can't find it immediately, then I'm gonna actually. You want know easier way to look at it is our scroll. Um, bullet point just to see the context because who who has <laughs> who has time to learn all the Sefer Yeshayahu these days when there's so much Mishle to learn um Mishle is how we prevent another Yeshayahu I mean not prevent another prophet but pre prevent another Hurban uh okay so if uh, yeah hold on a second uh Yud Gimel Hess oh that's a surprise this is about the destruction of Bavel. Who knew? Okay, so but the point is, is that it's divine wrath, right? It's, it's uh, wrath of God. Um, uh, any other ones? And then there's the Tzfani one, which we saw, and then there's ours. Okay, so there's only three kinds, three times. There's uh, destruction of Bavel, destruction at the uh, time of Yumos Mashiach, when the everyone's going to be judged, and then our Pasuk. So it worked, Rifki. Good suggestion. <laughs> okay, I remember my question. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, what kind of tzedakah are we talking about? Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So tzedakah, um, yeah. So what does tzedakah mean in this context? Yeah. And, um, the two broad options are charity or righteousness, right? But, uh, but still we need particulars. Also, just based off of what we just looked up then about the yeah. day of fury, 
should we be interpreting that more as like, I feel like for me, at least it makes more sense to think about it in a more holistic view rather than like a personal view. So should yeah. we be thinking more like that because of the examples? Not necessarily. And the reason why is because uh, Shlomo HaMelech is entitled to his own usage. And he also did use it before Yeshayahu came along, you know? So um, because Shlomo, Yeshayahu is prophesying about the destruction of the base of Mikdash and Shlomo HaMelech built the base of Mikdash, right? So um, so he, he is entitled to his own thing, but, but I, I'd say like, just keep both in mind, you know? Um, what's the difference also between day of fury and death and is wealth the opposite of charity? Okay. Yeah. So let's go here. What is the relationship between day of fury and death? And then what do you say is Sadaka the opposite of of oh wait is wealth the opposite of yeah it's wealth opposite of sadaka right yeah um uh so let's just do it like this let's just put that into one question what's the relation between day of fearing death and uh sadaka sorry uh wealth and sadaka yeah so that that opens up an interesting possibility i didn't spell wealth right um that opens up an interesting possibility here because then it wouldn't really mean it's not having wealth per se, but if you said wealth is the opposite of tzedakah, then what, what like bracketed word would you add to wealth? Maybe. Like withholding. Yeah. Like withholding, right. It's like, like, like it would have the connotation of a lot of money, not because like, according to this, if you had wealth, but you also gave tzedakah seemingly, then you would not be in the first half, you'd be in the second half. So it means like withheld wealth. Yeah. I mean, do, do, oh, sorry, sorry, go. Okay, like next, like, I don't know if this is like, if I'm just saying my question again, but I think what's bothering me about the Pasuk is that it's like two bad, two bad results. And then like, never mind. I need to think about it for a second. Okay, Ariel. Yeah, uh, did we ask what is wealth here? Uh, no, we did not. And that is a good question. Um, so what does wealth mean in this context? Um, is it uh, just lots of money or withheld money or other? Yeah. Do we not have Zach tonight? Uh, you know, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not living. I'm still not living with him. Um, yeah. All right. So hopefully he swoops in and like gives a, <laughs> a, a creative, creative way to read the puzzle. Cause this is, I, I don't know if you saw in the description and, and that I posted in the chat for the sheer, the challenge of this is going to be to, to like put a new spin on, on a, what looks like a Michelet a cliche. Right. Uh, and usually Zach's pretty good at doing that, but we'll, we can, we can band together and, and try to do something. Where's Sean? Uh, Sean doesn't come to the night sheer anymore uh, because he wants to uh, have a bacchus, uh, or I don't know if it's a bacchus uh, seder, but he wants to do like intensive work on reading and translating. So good for him. Yeah. yeah. Is, is, did we define this elsewhere? Is wealth actual money? Cause you uh, just did a right. question that says lots of money or withheld money or, yeah. or does so, it, even I'll, put I'll it in is it even money or is it wealth in something else? Yeah. So for example, if we said Sadaka does not mean charity, but it means righteousness, then does wealth also mean, you know, it would be weird to contrast charity and wealth seem to be a good contrast, but righteousness and wealth seem to be like a weird contrast. So then it might mean something else. And like, why wouldn't wealth like help? Yeah. Okay. So let, let's actually, yeah. Um, uh let's put that question here okay so what uh is the hava amina of the first half okay meaning um why would one think that wealth would avail okay uh and then why doesn't it okay I have a Mishle question in general. Yeah. Like, 
does Mishlei a lot of times use like talk about like God, God's intervention, or is it? I think of it mostly as practical things. So like, yeah. So that happens to be a. Uh, I, I won't call it a mock locus. I'll just call it a uh, a difference of emphasis in the Mafarshan. Okay. So you'll get people like Rashi and uh, who else likes to do this? Rashi Matudas does this a lot. Also, Sadigon does this a lot, where it talks about um, about divine punishment either in this world or the next world, and then you'll get others. Uh, who will mostly focus on the natural consequences. And they, you'll get a Miri who's like, whatever, man, you could learn it either way. You know, like he'll say, like I had, uh, I had one, when, when did we have this? I'm trying to remember if it was in this sheer. Actually, it might have been in our last Pazak. Let me just look up the last Pazak one second. Um, Mishle 11.3. And it's possible we just didn't do this parish. If it is in Miri, then... It's a good example. Oh, that was that long review we did. Uh, hold on. Eerie. Yeah, oh, so check this out. Uh, so can you see the me eerie here? I, I don't know if I need to share a new, no, okay. So let me, I need to share a new window then. Uh, share, I'm just gonna share this whole thing. Yeah, so on our last Pasuk, okay, now, now we're, gonna, we're gonna, not gonna do this three weeks in a row, don't worry. Okay, I just wanna, Tumas Yishraim Tanchim V'Sel Bodhi Mishadim. So the perfection of the upright will guide them and the corruption of the uh, Bogdim, um, the, what do we go with, self-underminers? Traitors, whatever, will we'll, uh, we'll rob them, okay? So he says like this, uh, uh, the the uh, perfection of the upright will guide them. Um, this means um, and it'll it'll guide them and protect them from tragedies and like uh, uh, causes you know causes of of, of, of badness. Uh, whether it is by way of the constellations, which means like the laws of nature, or by way of chance. Okay, then he says, this is the one I wanted to get to, and the corruption of the Bogdim will destroy them. Whether by way of punishment, uh, even though it doesn't, it's not warranted by nature or by chance. So he talks about uh, punishment, nature, and chance as just possibilities of things that can happen to you. I personally, um, I've, I'm fine with the Me'iri, um, but I don't like to uh, bring in something that has to do with divine punishment unless there's something in the Pasuk that points that way. And in our Pasuk, there is something that points that way because we saw that Yom Evra does imply like a divine punishment. But you could also say that Day of Wrath is just like a really, really bad day, you know, like in terms of like, like Hurricane Sandy or whatever was like a Day of Wrath, you know, I mean, like widespread destruction doesn't have to mean like divine punishment for specific, uh, you know, sins. It could just be like being subject to to the wrath of God in, in other ways. Yeah, that was a good methodology question. Um, let's elaborate on this also. When it says, uh, what is the, how you know, the first half, how would one think that wealth would avail? Uh, specifically, what does the person think their wealth will, like, will, will accomplish, right? Um, Meaning, like, how do they envision? Like, how do you see this going down? You know, if you, you know, if you've got your, again, if this is a hurricane, Sandy, or if this is God's judgment, are you just like taking like hundred dollar bills and like throwing them up to Shemaim? You know, uh, like, and 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 what what does he exactly think that that's gonna do? Yeah. And and, and another question is like, who's this puzzle referring to? Is it referring to the Russia, the Tzaddik, the? Yeah. Uh... Okay, so that's an important one here. Okay, more important than usual. Who is the audience of this Pasuk? Uh, uh, seeing as how no Mishlaic personality types are mentioned. Okay, yeah. and the, 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 and 10 2 specified wickedness, wickedness, whereas our Pasuk deliberately omits it so in other words it does not seem like our pasuk is 
the first half is talking about like a Russia. So that leaves the the the, the audience, you know, seemingly wide wide open, or at least wider than than the first one. On Ariel's question, like, and the one you just wrote, I was actually thinking, like, in general with Michelle, we've had other stuff from that do this that don't include specific personalities. Right. I was wondering if that means for us that in terms of our interpretation, could we be like understanding these ideas as less of like a personality thing and more of a concept in general of like, let's say like we often attribute certain characteristics like a tzaddik or a rasha, whereas yeah. maybe these specific things are more universal in terms of like, you know, even if you're a tzaddik, you could fall into this trap or even if, and I know that happens in general, but like more yeah. so. so I would say yes, but <laughs> I'd say yes, if we took this on its own, but let me show you something which I only noticed because the other Mepharshim were talking about it, okay? And uh, so the, what we did last week is we did the Rubin Yonah's essay on, like, you know, mini essay on the Tom and the Osher, and he said, now I'm introducing the Tom and the Osher. So when I first read that, I thought he, it was just him introducing it, okay? But check out the next couple of psukim that are in store for us, okay? So this is our pasuk. So last pasuk was Tumas Yisharim Tanachem Veselet Bogim Yishadim. Okay, so if you do a search for Yashar, hold on, uh, Yashar. So we have it in five and in six, okay? Uh, and in 11 and in uh, and 24, okay? So really, we don't really care about those later ones, but we have here Yasharim, Yashar, and Yashar. And then our Pasuk is, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, not, it doesn't say a name, okay? Then you have, um, hold on, Tumas uh, Yasharim Tanchim. And then here in the next one, we have Tzidkas Tamim Tiyasher Darko, okay? And then you have for, oops, you have for Bogdim, you have three is Sel of Bogdim, and then in six you have uh, Bogdim, right? So it looks like we are in a cluster of, um, of, uh, of Psukim about Yesharim, Bogdim, and, 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 and uh, Tom, you know? So that's the only thing, Rivki, that's making me like wonder is our Pasuk supposed to be learned somehow in that context, you know? And by the way, I, I was thinking about this when I, when I noticed that phenomenon. If there's one thing that this Monday night year has changed in my Derech Halimud of Mishle and my way I learned Mishle, is it has made me aware that like, there are huge themes in Mishle, like in terms of, like I used to just be of the opinion that the Pasukim were basically random, except for like clusters of two or three. And, Going through the whole thing of chapter 10 with the Tzadik and the Russia, it does seem like there are much, much, much bigger like chunks that deal with themes. So I don't know what to do with that, but uh, I this I, that's changed over the course of the last like year and a month, you know? So um, just want to voice that. Wait, so are you, are you saying that you're more inclined now to attribute these to like the Bodim and then the Yashar? I am more open to that. Yeah, I think I used to be of the opinion that... Uh, yeah, I know it's radical, right? <laughs> I think I used to be of the opinion that you take the pasuk in isolation unless you're forced to take it with the, uh, the context. Like sometimes it's very clear that the pasuk is paired with another one. But now I think I am of the opinion that it could be both, that either you take it on its own or you look at it in the surrounding context. And that might not be true of all of Mishle, but uh, for example, in my morning Mishle shear, then that has not been the case uh, as, as strongly as it has been here. So I don't know if this is just like in the, the early program of Mishle uh, uh, or, or not. Um, actually, it's not even true. In the early, last year, the first half of the year, then I think a lot of our Pesukim were the same. Yeah, I don't know. My, my uh, Mishle intuition is sh shifting because of this. So. What yeah, actually, I, I I think you're right. I think I th it happens to be, I think this Pesuk is, I think, related to the Tom of the Yashar. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, I'll tell you another argument for saying it would be related to the time of the Yashar is because this is almost, well, because half of this is a verb, not all, this is almost a verbatim repetition of a puzzle that we had earlier. So it might stand to reason, oh, and not only that, in the previous, okay, check this out. In the previous parak, the first puzzle, um, no, that's weird. Okay, whatever. In the previous parak, at the beginning of the topic of the Tzadik and the Russia, you had this puzzle. And here it's the beginning of the topic of the, the Tom and the Yashar, and you have this other, this puzzle here also. So it almost is like, like, oh, and this might fit in with our theory. Okay, we, we had the theory uh, two Shirim ago about how Sadiq and Russia have to do with your conduct towards the system outside of yourself. 
and Tom and Yashar have to do, and Bogate have to do with your relationship to your own values. So it's possible that like, after dealing with the, the, the categories of Tzadik and Rasha in the previous parak, and showing how they relate to wealth, now it's dealing with Tom and Yosher and Bogate and showing how their how wealth plays itself out in terms of their uh, inner you know dynamics. This is dangerous. What we're doing, by the way, okay, it's dangerous in the sense that we're like uh, like speculating about what the pasuk means before we've analyzed the pasuk. Uh, but I'm just I don't know getting caught up in the uh, in 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 the breeze of the of, of the context. You know. Can I ask like maybe it's like an observation and I don't know if it was said already because I sure. came on late. But um, just this, I feel like there's a concept of like having versus like giving. And I was wondering if that's like a general, like if this can be applied to other things besides for like whatever it is, like wealth or money. It seems to be like within this pasuk, the common theme is money. But is this concept of like having something versus being the giver of it, right. is that a quality that would apply to like these things that would yeah. happen? It so that's a good question. And uh, I'm not going to list it as a separate one. Cause I think if you combine two questions, then we have that we had, what does wealth mean in this context? Is it lots of money uh, or money withheld uh, or other? And then is it even money or is it wealth in something else? So that opens up the possibility you were talking about. And then we had Schiffer's question of um, is wealth the opposite of Sadaka? So if you were to say that wealth is not just money, but it's other some other goods or doing of good, uh, then, uh, then yeah, then this might extend to other areas also. Certainly if you say that Sadaka refers to righteousness and not charity, you know, that really opens it up. Yeah. Or I was thinking like any type of, let's say gift or quality that you have right. that other people would be able to benefit from. Right. Knowledge, you know, yeah. um, uh, time, whatever. Yeah. Are, okay. are we ready for uh I, are we uh did we miss any obvious ones uh did we say benefit in what sense yeah we did that's kind of like yeah you know what let's just put this here benefit oops avail in what sense that's all part of that question uh, uh we did not ask how does sadaka save you from death no we didn't right so um how does Siddhaka save a person from death? Uh, another question is, um, yeah. what's the difference between death and a day of fury? Do, do yeah, we, we, we asked what is the relationship between death and a day of fury. So I think that's... Okay. Uh, All right. and, then, and then also, excuse me, side questions are context questions. Okay. Um, uh, is this Pasuk related to the um surrounding context and then also how does this differ from 10 to okay so uh you know what i'm gonna move 10 to so we can get it all on one screen we also why does targum translate it as falsehood and not wealth oh yeah that is weird right yeah, yeah. um yeah I'm not going to list that as a question because we'll just have that as a question on him. But that is a that is a I, it's a very puzzling question. Um, Hone, like when I looked at the all Torah thing, I don't think it said anything about um, uh, what do you call it? like uh, falsehood, and I don't think falsehood is the opposite of tzedakah. So I have no idea where he's getting it from. Uh, I'm just trying to think. Is it? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> it's a good question. Okay, so let's do thinking. And before we do thinking, I'm just going to say this now because I'm going to forget it at the end. Next week, Blee Netter, we are on. But the week after, which is the last day of Hanukkah, we are not on. Okay? I'm fine with that. Okay. So I'm going to be on a plane back then anyway, so. Okay, works out. Yeah. I did For selfish read, reasons. I <laughs> yep, Mishlaic reasons. Okay. All right, so uh, <laughs> let's... Yeah, another question? Sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Gotta get the crap. Um, yeah. When it says, like, is the person doing, like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Maybe I need another minute. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, let's have her thinking, and then, and then you can always interrupt. Okay.
Okay, who has uh, any half-baked ideas? I have like a very basic idea, which I well, I know is a problem. No, um, but, but remember, just let, let's just refresh, uh, hopefully remember your idea. Let's just refresh your memory for when we have um, uh, cliche sounding uh, Mishle. So Kim, I mentioned there's two routes you can take. Either like try to go out of your way from the get go to like latch onto something that is a new angle, you know, or take the obvious idea and then say it and develop it. And then maybe that'll lead to something new. So it's, it's fine to say something that is, uh, that sounds like a, 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 you know, a not new idea. Good, because Go it's going to sound basic. Okay. Um, so I was thinking that, especially with all of these things in the Pasuk, I felt like they were all very connected to things that we feel like we have control over, but we actually don't. So yeah. I was thinking like wealth and then also like charity or righteousness. I feel like we feel we have those things in our control but it's also death. Like, I feel like I like contrary on that. Um, and I think that what the rela the relationship between wealth and then the charity, I was focusing on the aspect of like feeling that control because you have a opportunity to either have a healthy relationship or a not healthy relationship. So if you have a not healthy relationship, I think that we often feel like, oh, like, you know, we always hear the expression like money buys happiness or oh no that's not the one whatever we could say that like people <laughs> you, know, like, you know from Kohelet obviously like yeah when you have money you often feel like you have first of all control over everything and I think it could be yeah. a very ego problem and I think that maybe Shlomo is bringing in specifically like a day of fury to show that that's actually not true and that even though it might make you feel as if you do have control that it won't save you from that and then you can also contrast that with the death and see like, you know, it won't save you from death, but what will save you from death, something that is like a Torah value. Um, and also I think if you translate it as like righteousness, um, I was gonna say like you could have, cause I don't think Shlomo thinks money is a bad thing. I think it's just right. wealth and unhealthy amounts. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, those were like, uh, like that was like a baker's dozen of half baked ideas, <laughs> right? That wasn't, that wasn't, unless, unless I'm missing the unity, but a lot, lot of, a uh, lot of, a uh, partial ideas here. So what I got was number one, uh, it is wealth will not benefit on a day of, uh, wrath means that, uh, that people feel like if they have money, then they can control everything that happens to them because you do use money to buy a lot of good stuff and to like, you know, pay off, whatever use it to spend on preventing a lot of bad stuff so you get into this mentality that i can use it to ward off anything that's bad but there's always going to be a limit to what you can actually control with uh the money you know um and or how much you can control of your life with, with money and those things outside and the funny thing is like this maybe if you take that even further so let's take the person who has uh um uh you know a million dollars okay so he's going to be able to like, you know, um, get rid of certain bad things like, uh, you know, starvation and uh, certain types of like medical stuff, you know, and let's say the guy who has a billion dollars is going to be even able to do even more, which means that if you take the billion dollar stuff, the, the, the guy that the billion, the bad things that the billion dollar the billionaire, that's what we call those people, <laughs> that the billionaire uh, can control it's going to include a lot of things, but then the stuff outside of the control is going to be really bad. You see what I'm saying? Like, so, so for him, he's going to perceive it as a day of wrath, you know, uh, like the, um, you know, like a per let, let's say, I'm going to use a sad example, but let's say like you have a person who is, um, uh, you know, who is poor and gets a disease. So that is sad, but the poor person knows, like, obviously I can't afford like medical care. So, so it's not like particularly wrathful. It's just that, okay, I got unlucky, but the guy who, who thinks that who gets some incurable disease and thinks like my money can't save me, like it's going to be perceived as wrath, not just as something bad, you know? So I that might be, know, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was, that was just the, um, <laughs> that was me putting a uh, frosting on a half baked cookie. Right. So, so we have to like bake the other half of the cookie, uh, and see if it plays out. Okay. But it was, it was a good, 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 uh, good, good cookie. Um, okay. Then the other thing you said was that it's more about your relationship to the money than the amount of money. So 
there and that's kind of reminiscent of like what uh what um did that have anything to do with what avital was saying or am i imagining this wait can you explain which part you're talking about yeah uh, saying that hone is not specifically a lot of money it really is like the withholding of the money i know your point avital was about like whether it's even limited to money or not yeah yeah i think what you're saying though is right like the holding versus like having i think it does have part like to do with yeah. your relationship oh that, that, that's that, that was what triggered my mind is that's how you start off your, your your questions holding versus having right uh and so it's not the having it's the holding that's the problem uh and so so if you were relating to your money in the correct way then that could save you from death but we don't really know what that death is yet right uh, uh you didn't take a stance on that did you no okay yeah so that, that's that's a good good uh good good track here Can i yeah. try to add a little bit to it yeah sure sure so i had like a similar also maybe like quarter baked i don't know what you want to call it okay. um I just water all over myself and that's immortalized forever okay yeah go ahead <laughs> <laughs> um so i was thinking in like a similar vein but that um in terms of like righteousness like saves from death i think well, I was taking in terms of righteousness, like certain things that you feel like are so big because whether it's your big ego or you have a lot of money or whatever it is, I think that like bringing it down a step and making it less serious and you realize what the reality is of the situation, that that really saves you from death or like I was trying to think of it kind of small scale to like almost apply to let's say my life where like you have people who are driving on the road and I love sitting in traffic and watching people's reactions like you're yeah. really just <laughs> there's something really enjoyable about it that like you see some people just like are getting really like this is it like God has like taken it upon himself to like attack them personally and like you have other people who are like amazing like I didn't have time to put on like my makeup this morning and who yeah. use it as like you know, but like, That's I think so that part of that really saves people from like almost their own death of like their whole peace of mind. I think that, yeah. I don't know. Okay. So, so th what's interesting here, and I, I did not expect this to happen, but I was explaining the Evra based on what Ruth was using. I was explaining Evra as like a highly subjective, um, uh, a highly subjective, uh, like, egocentric perception of the bad stuff that happens and what you're saying is that that's also how we're reading death right like it's saving you like from like like I mean, is that that's meaning like from like 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 death like swooning like oh like this like i i you know i'm, I'm gonna die in this traffic you know um and so it, it so both halves of the puzzle are really putting it in terms of um of the hyperbole like the hyperbolic way that our emotions uh, cause us to to fear it Okay, so that, I like that reading. Now the question is, how does Sadaka help and what is the Sadaka exactly? I was going to ask Avita, like when you're translating it with those ideas, how are you reading? Are you reading it as righteousness and not charity? Yeah, I was thinking righteousness, like as in like, I guess like a reality, like that Sadik has like a form of reality. That's how I was kind of mm -hmm. looking at it. So like, yeah. how do you contrast that with wealth then? Well, well, it was withheld wealth, right? The, that's what you're saying, Avital, right? It's like the person who's who's just uh, not uh, using the wealth for anything other than like self um, self absorbed uh, protection and benefit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna just try something here. The way that we're trending right now almost seems to be that it is the wealth being used in a way that's contrary to sadaka and which that's not a big chiddush but like because the puzzle says sadaka but like if you are you if you are using your wealth or resources i'm not going to limit it to wealth necessarily for um for the system then that's going to cause you to view the bad stuff that happens in a different way than than the person who is only using whatever resources that they have for their own self-preservation and their own self-advancement so you can also say it would contrast with righteousness because if you are using right. wealth, then it is in a righteous way. Like you're using it properly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So is this a complete idea? Because if it is, then I think we could take it out of the oven, so to speak. And, uh, and, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the rest of the metaphor is, but, um, so what we, let, let's say what we have so far, right. We have, um, 
So the, what would you say the subject of the puzzle is the way that we're learning it? Like what's the unifying topic according to this way? And who's it for? I think if we get those two questions, then maybe that'll clar clarify things. I honestly think it could be for anyone because everybody has wealth in some kind of way. Like also that kind of sounds cliche, but like whatever your gift is, whether it's actual money or whether it's, um, let's say your time is really valuable or you have knowledge in a certain area that other people don't, I think it could be used from like any of these things. Yeah. So the only thing that, that, uh, I, I think this is just part of the word. I think hone does mean like extreme wealth. Now that doesn't like go against what you're saying, but I think the puzzle would be focusing on someone who has, uh, an extremely, an extreme good or, or prized quality to the point where they trust in it to solve a bunch of problems um, uh, that that other people are subject to that they think that they're the exception of, you know? So like uh, this would be, um, you know, let's say someone has uh, is very, very popular, right? Uh, and, uh, oh, here's a good example. So let's say like, you know, during that, that uh, time, like I guess uh, French Revolution um, started it maybe, like if you were, you know, a member of royalty, you kind of felt like your position was secure forever, you know, you and your dynasty. And then you see all these revolutions going along and you're like, uh oh, like that's not going to help me, you know, uh, or it might even hurt me. Um, or if you are very, very smart and, uh, and like, you know, uh, you, you know, you let's say like rely on your, um, your intelligence to like get you out of like a, a you know, to, to like, you, you do something risky in terms of business or whatever. And you, you say, you know, you somehow feel that your intelligence is going to be able to like, let you outsmart, like smart your way out of the, of the situation. Uh, then it's going to, you're going to have this effect of like, you're going to realize that no matter how much wealth you have in this area, you can't control this. And it's going to be perceived as a day of wrath. Now let's flip it to the second half. So tzedakah. So let's just review our, our basic definition of tzedakah here. Um, uh, could we be more specific than what Avital was saying about the reality thing, even though I agree that, you know, has something to do with reality? Could we define Sadaka and explain how it can save you from this type of death, um, even if it's not like, uh, you know, literal, uh, literal death? I think there's like a certain quality about Sadaka that like takes a person out of, um, like it introduces like community and that yeah. introduces like being a part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah. And so that's like very um, humbling. Yeah. So I saw a, uh, I don't know if this is what he meant, but I saw, I don't even know if this is a paraphrase. So I saw a quote attributed to Socrates, but it was paraphrased from both the apology and the Crito. So I, I, I think it's a paraphrase. He said, and, and you know, so Socrates gets, gets condemned to death. Uh, for you know, corrupting the youth for teaching them philosophy. So the, the the quote or the paraphrase was, "They might kill me, but they can't hurt me," which I thought was a really cool way of of saying that. I think for most people, most pe most people would view the uh, the killing as the ultimate hurting. But Socrates was really saying, "No, killing is just killing me is just something that like they can do." But the real the real Socrates is like the 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 knowledge and the ideas that you know that are now like in the world or that are you know that are out there that are that are beyond the particular self like the particular all particular people are going to die so you, you can't like stop that but um but uh because of the impact that you have on the system or let's say like um i was actually re where, where did this come up oh in my my home year last week i was rehashing the we did the puzzle last year in like November also about um, uh, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, that the memory of the Tzadik is for, or, sorry, the, yeah, the memory of the Tzadik is for a blessing. And so I reread the Ramam. I probably showed this to you guys that um, in Halacha, you don't build uh, a huge monument tombstone like a Matseva on the graves of Tzadikim because he says their, their, um, their words are their memorial. Like that's the real... The impact that their words have that goes on and on uh, past their lifetime that affects people and the good that comes from that that's really the the, the memorial of the tzaddik. Um, the reason why I'm using these two examples, by the way, is because I am trying to say that like no one can save you from actual death, 
Um, so, so when Schiffer said the community thing, I'm thinking about like ways that your actions can benefit that would uh, last beyond you. But, but I feel like now I'm drifting from the way Avital was taking it. Can Not I just that, comment that, on that, what you were yeah. saying before? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. About yeah. how it's extreme wealth. I yeah. feel like it's like, uh, what's that for? Like a call the Homer almost like if extreme wealth is not oh, going right. to benefit you like that on your day of whether it's dramatic fury or like actual, right. whatever it is that yeah. like, yeah. of course your whatever little gifts you're given or like your millionaire even like yeah. is not going to help you. Okay, good. So then that actually helps me with the second half, I think, because now we could say that even an act of Tadaka or even a little bit of Tadaka or even Sadaka, that's not extremely impactful, but let's say that's all you can do, that will have this effect. But I still I feel like we're missing something. How could we just maybe let's just go through more examples? Um, even though I liked the uh, the traffic example, but like let's use an example that, that involves uh Tzedaka that can save you from viewing the things that happen to you as as death. So Robert Shimas, um yeah. I, I'm not I think this might help. Uh, sure. with this approach but I, it can also be a branch off to a different approach okay you know, say with, it. we'll put it on the table okay so i, I was i was i was thinking about the shipper's question the relationship between you know the wealth and the and the uh um tzedakah, meaning like like wealth is just you know it doesn't necessarily have to be money it's just that you have something that can benefit people whether it's money or knowledge or some, something you can do or whatever, but you just yeah. you withhold that and you keep it to yourself versus tzedakah is something where you you have and you actively give out to people. Right. Meaning in, in, in a time of, meaning just like naturally speaking, like if you do good to people, if you do good for other people, like that will always make an impact in the right. world or to other people. And they're almost like, because of um, they feel like indebted or they feel like a sense of obligation to help you back, they will help you in a time of crisis. And that's ultimate. And that is your death. Meaning the fact that you're in a situation of, you're in a very, you know, extreme, terrible situation. Yeah. They're saving you from that situation because of what you've done. Right. Okay. So th this is an interesting thing then, because we have now, uh, I think two candidates for day of wrath and death. The first one was that it's things outside of your control that are bad. Right. Um, uh, and it's being said, we, we theorize that it's being said in like exaggerated terms because that's the, that's where the real suffering comes from. Uh, right. It's like, you know, being stuck in traffic is not, death but people can make it in death and they'll get you know blown into a rage uh because of it um i gotta mention this sorry uh, this might not be uh entirely <laughs> relevant but uh this morning uh from the hours of 6 10 a.m until 7 15 a.m okay there was this couple across the street this in the, in the you know in the apartment building across like non-jewish couple I, actually, I don't even know if they're a couple. They might have just been neighbors yelling at each other at the top of their lungs, okay? Like yelling. Now, I obviously, when people have arguments, then they yell, but there's usually like an escalation and then like it, it goes down. And at a certain point, I was wondering, like, maybe they're both just deaf, like, like that, they're just, but they're, they're yelling in anger at each other for an hour and they're standing outside of the building. So like, it's, I, I can hear this for an hour, you know? And I was thinking like, and at one point that thought into my mind of like, and I heard enough of their words that I could tell that it didn't seem to be like a matter of life or death. I was like, what is it, what must it be like to be in a world where some, some conflict like this erupts in an hour of, of continual yelling, you know? Uh, and like, I feel like people do this. So like, it's, it's, the, it's the same thing as the traffic example where like, you know, or like every day, and again, this is so much uh, life outside my window here. Like there's this daycare next to me, uh, which is definitely like, you know, uh, this neighborhood was not designed for a daycare because every day at like 3 p.m., all the cars pull up and then you get all this honking and just honking and honking and honking. And like, at a certain point, I'm like, okay, this, it's everyone's just making themselves more, more upset, you know? So 
that's the type of like death and, and day of wrath that we're talking about here is like the exaggeration, the exaggerated suffering that comes from your inability to control something and you're feeling that it's happening to you. Okay, that's one approach. Ariel is suggesting, I think, a different approach. They overlap, but it's a different approach because according to Ariel's thing, then the thing that the Yom Evra is, uh, is the, the bad, that the harm that the Yom Evra is causing can be averted through the beneficial effects of the tzedakah that the guy gives to the community. Like somehow that, that, will, uh, that will help him. And I, I'm actually, even though I liked our first idea, I'm more inclined to that because I do want to say that this is, whatever the death is, it's something that you can actually be saved from. I mean, I know that the first approach was like that also. I don't know. But those so are two I, approaches, I think, yeah. So I don't want to continue in my theory because we haven't finished the first one. So just let me know when I could do that. Sure. Right? You know, I'm going to actually ask you to continue in your theory now, because I think I do want to just maybe by comparing the two approaches, then we'll uh, we'll we'll see them more clearly. Uh, OK. And and the other question uh, and the other question I was um, you know trying to answer was like, what's the hobby? And why would someone think that wealth um, can be beneficial? Yeah. And, and I th and this is why. I think that this Pasuk is referring to a Tom and a Yasha. Okay, go ahead. Because go it's ahead. not inherently bad that you have wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it's just what is bad is that you just keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what you do is you, you have the wealth. Um, and you may think that, oh, because I have wealth, I can always get out of my, get out of, you know, situations because I have all this knowledge, this power, whatever, whatever it is that can help people. And I haven't helped people until, a, until a point where I, where I have to save people just so I can save myself versus the second half of the puzzle is where you have been helping people just for the sake of helping people, you know, and that's Tadaka. You know, so I may think that that is great because that's all I need. But in, re in reality, no, there's another step you need to accomplish. I miss the connection to Tom and Yashar. It's more about how, like, you know, it's, it's not exactly, you know, like the Tom and Yashar, how we were you know, translated, but it's like the, the same line of thinking about how, like, you have, like, the baseline mm -hmm. thinking versus um doing the extra step uh-huh i see um i mean no, nothing more than that it's just okay yeah all right so let's continue working on either of those approaches and see where we can get and if we need to be we'll go to the mafarshim anyone have any other ideas either on these two approaches or uh or just uh in independent uh things You want to check out some Mafarshim and see if that jump starts uh, some ideas. <laughs> I mean, I, again, I'm not saying that what we have is not good. I just uh, I'm having a hard time getting further than that. Okay, so let's look at some Mafarshim. Uh, I I flagged a couple of them that looked promising. So the first one that I flagged was uh, I didn't actually like flag them with actual flags. Oh, this one really intrigued me. Rav Moshe Kimchi. Okay, so he says. Lo yoil le bogdim hanis karim le el mamonam biom shis aber bam hashem. So the bog the the wealth of the bogdim mentioned above in the previous pasuk will not benefit them on the day that God is angry at them. Utsadaka tatil mimavis ha mimavis ha bogdim, and Sadaka will save you from the death of the bogdim. Okay, so he puts it all in terms of the the bogdim. So let's just review who the bogdim were. Uh, anyone remember uh, from last week uh, uh, or two weeks ago, really, who the Bogdim were? 
this is where we need Zach to remind us. Actually, no, Zach sent me his notes. Hold on. Zach sent me his notes two, two weeks ago. Uh, so I can, I can read them. Hold on. Oh, Zach is here even when he's not here. I'll tell him you said that. Yeah. Uh, that might encourage him to not be here. <laughs> okay. So he said, um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay, he reminded me. Uh, I'm not going to say it in his words, though. But um, the, oh, this was from Rabin and Yona. This is not from our first, this is not from our first idea. Or was it? No, this is not from our first idea. This is from last week. So the bogeyed, oh, now I'm confused. I thought you were referring to what Sean was saying two weeks ago about the bogey. Uh, yeah, that, that's way too long ago for me to remember. So what Zach has here is he said that the um, the Tom, uh, I can't reconstruct from his notes. Man. I think like, I don't think this is going to be perfect. Not yeah, yeah, sure. Or whatever. Um, yeah. But I think that we were essentially saying that they, unlike the Yashar, that they didn't have like the foundation in order to be able to go past letter of the law. And it was more so like, because they didn't have that foundation and they only had really like their own ideas and their own values, but they wanted to go past, but they couldn't. That was for Sean's idea. Correct. Right. I think that was for Sean's. For Sean's approach, we had the Tom had the letter of the law, which was like sticking to like that sort of discipline that comes from the law and the Yasha and the Bogade were both trying to go beyond the letter of the law. But the Yasher had his basis in the Tom, which was if he went too far, he could fall back on lawfulness or something like that. And the Bogey was just going off on his own, uh, trying to do extra. Um, but um, but then, OK, yeah, forget it. I liked what the, the Moshe Kimberly said, but it requires remembering what we did last week. So let's nix that. Uh, who else? Uh, there was one other. Pro oh, Malbin. OK, so the Malbin. Wait, was the Malbin? Okay, hold on. So the problem is with uh, Tumim Mufarshin, and I can't remember who said what. So it's like, uh, Yona. Ian, this fucking is talking to you, Shelly. So that was me, Mom. All right, maybe it was the Mom. I'm going to try, try the Mom. The Mom here. Yeah, Mom says like this. Even though wealth does help at a time of peace, like it says, the wealth of the uh, of the wealthy man is his fortress of strength. On a day of general wrath, like at a time of plague, or war, it will not help. So, He's learning Yom Ever as widespread universal uh, harm. Keep a hefech. Yeah, this is the one I want to keep, uh, but rather the opposite. Az yish osher shamur levalav lara. So then wealth will be kept by its owners for their harm. So that's like a thing where, you know, if you are wealthy and it's a time of peace, so then your wealth gives you tremendous advantages. But if the enemy breaks in and, 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 and like uh, invades your country, guess who they're coming for first? They're coming for the wealthy people, you know? Um, or let's say uh, there's a plague, okay, um, and, uh, and, you know, people are dying. So if you have the wealth, people are going to, like, want to go to you to, to, to sustain them, and you're going to get mobbed. Um, okay, aval hatsadaka tatil mimavis gambiom ever, but tzedakah will even save you on the day of, of wrath. And in this sense, it's not a repetition of what's written above in 10 That's talking about natural death. Okay. So let's look at what mom says on that puzzle, just, just so we can understand ours. So on that puzzle, he says, so again, that puzzle said, um, the wealth of uh, the treasuries of wickedness will not save them. Sorry, will not benefit them. And so saves from death. So he says, Yo'il yesh tov umo'il. There is something which is good and beneficial. shel kesef utbua hagam she'en bam tov yuchlu lahoil be'es hadchak. And let's say uh, treasuries of produce of money and produce, even though there's no inherent good in them, they can benefit on, at a time of uh, of uh, of you know of need. Va'otros resha, but treasuries of wickedness. 
Hainu Otros Shinitsburu Aide Resh of Hamas. That means treasuries that were accumulated through wealth and robbery, sorry, through uh, um, uh, evil and robbery. Einbam Aftuels. There's no benefit in them. Ulakaman, okay, now he quotes uh, our Pasuk. I think this is supposed to be our Pasuk, even though it says Yod Dalid. Um, Amar lo yo ilahon biom evra. It says that uh, wealth will not benefit on a day of wrath. Vahon shall Russia lo yo il af be shalom. The wealth of the Russia will not benefit him even on a day, a time of peace. Vahat sadaka shi hamasim tovim bein adon lamakom tatil mimavis. But but sadaka, which is good actions bein adon lamakom between man and God, will save from death. See, I, okay, I took that differently. I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore that. Okay, well, let's ignore that for now. What do you think he means in the, in our Pasuk when he says, so it's clear that that uh, wealth will benefit at a time of peace, but it won't benefit at a time of wrath when there's widespread destruction because then you'll become a target. You'll have a big target on your back. Um, but what do you think he means when he says, Sadaka will save from death even on a day of wrath? Yeah, I don't understand that because like even if you're wealthy and you're given Sadaka, it sounds like they're coming for you anyway. Right, but it doesn't say that you're wealthy though, right? What's the difference? I mean, let's say you're wealthy and you are giving tzedakah and, you, and you're doing tzedakah. Right. Well, let's deal with that case later. Let's deal with the regular case of tzedakah first, and then we can understand the uh, the exceptional case. I think I can answer this with a half baked approach that I was gonna sure. say before, but Good. like, I yeah. Was so confident. you just need more time to bake. Yeah. 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 Okay, but fair warning, I'm just having one of those days where I can't get words out, sure. where my mouth isn't connected to my brain. So okay. Okay, I was thinking about. <laughs> how you could relate to death versus like the, the day of fury. And yeah. I think death is like more personal. Like death is like, this is about me. And I think like it uses, I think the Pasuk is like comparing, is like really trying to compare wealth versus tzedakah and not so different like the day of fury and death, except in the way that like you relate to it. Cause those are both like the bad outcomes. <laughs> so I was thinking like, you, I was thinking, I guess, more in terms of like, like God's punishment on like a community, but I think it could also be like just people, like people, if one city were to invade another city or whatever, something like that, yeah. that like you relate to like, like that, the, the withhold, like the, sorry, but like not being a part of the community in your wealth like yeah. withholding wealth and not giving tzedakah, like when there's communal destruction, you like think of it as like, this is like my personal death. And so mm -hmm. like tzedakah kind of like takes away the way that like changes the way that you would relate to like mm -hmm. communal punishment as like something like, this is like about me. Like this is like my destruction and like this is my personal death and not just like a day of fury, you know? Okay. I, I feel like there's definitely, uh, but I, I see the potential that you're seeing in there. Um, uh, the question is, what do we do with it now, right? So let me just try stating it. So the Day of Fury is talking about a widespread uh, catastrophe that happens to the whole community. And to the person who is withholding, we're going with the withholding wealth thing, I assume. Yeah. So that person is going to just view it as... Uh, as this is happening to everybody, but the person who is attached to the community through supporting it with Sadaka, whether that's money or whether that's uh, actions, is gonna like take it personally, not in a bad way, but like in a, uh, as a, uh, like because he identifies with the community because he views himself as part of the, the entire system, then right. it'll be, it'll be a, um, it'll be, uh, it'll be like a death to him and Sadaka will save him from that in the sense that that's where I'm not getting. Okay, yeah. So I get what you're saying, but I was saying like the opposite. Like someone who withholds tzedakah or like withholds wealth. Oh, he's going to view it as... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to think of it as like, this is my personal death. Like this is my personal destruction. But I see. really it's like about the community and not just like a person. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, I, I get, uh, that, that's better then. Um, so, so if you... So it's using... So that's the confusing thing. So it's using death in the second half but it's talking to the first guy okay i see meaning that that it, you, you're clutching this well saying i don't want to die and saying well the only way that you can prevent yourself from dying meaning that 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 personal uh, tragedy is if you branch out and and spread this to the entire community 
uh, and then it'll save you from that personal loss because the, the your your uh, the thing you care about is not just yourself. It's really the you know the uh, the community and and you see in extreme cases of tzedakah where people like give up their lives for for others. You know then uh, that is how they feel. And I'm not even talking about like um, uh, the, uh, like I'll give you a dramatic example. I don't know if you heard about this, but remember with the, and actually maybe you guys were little when this happened. The, uh, I have, when did it happen? When did the Fukushima nuclear uh, disaster happen in Japan? And like that really, really bad thing. And like, you know, the meltdown, is this ringing a bell? Or were you guys too young? I think it was like 2010 or 2011. 2011, I think. Yeah, 2011. Yeah, right. So I heard, and I can't verify this, but that there were a bunch of, you know, Japanese people live a really long time, typically. So there were a bunch of, um, I don't remember if it was just old Japanese people, or if it was old Japanese people who were still suffering from like, uh, the radiation effects of the uh, of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that they volunteered to go into the dangerous zones to like, help um uh like do stuff to like i don't know if it was like for scientific purposes or like help clear stuff uh because they were saying basically like we're already old or we're already like sick from this radiation we want to serve the next generation of like like uh of, of of japan and so we'll sacrifice ourselves for the greater community you know and it was like a very and japan is a very like community oriented uh uh nation but um but like that's an example it's like they they they're not bothered by the prospect of their own death because they identify with the community at large and they really care about like preventing that from happening. And Sadaka is a way to do that because the more you, I think that's what you said earlier, Shepherd, when you weren't ready to give your idea yet, that like Sadaka is a way of, of, of cultivating this connection and identification with the community at large to the point where you will not um, care about your own personal life in the same way or your own personal needs in the same way as the, the hoarder will, you know? Yeah. That feels like a, a complete idea. So that fits into the Malbim because it's saying that, um, oh, sorry, this Malbim, that it will save you from death even on the day of, uh, of, of wrath because like Socrates said, they can, no, but that's, that's the opposite words. They can kill me, but they can't hurt me, you know? But, the, but the, really the way he said when he says that, but they can't hurt me, that's really what you're saying. They can't kill me. You know, um, so it, it works that way. Yeah, let's think of a more relatable example, though, instead of nuclear reactions to Socrates. <laughs> um, yeah. I was thinking about Hurricane Sandy because my yeah. dad always says like that, that like we became friends with our neighbors only when like a huge tragedy struck. And I think like that's true because like we were able to like help each other in this like communal destruction that we had that was like literally destruction like yeah. it wasn't just like we were on our own and like this was like oh, our basement like this is about our basement like no yeah. this is, like we were sharing this like with our neighbors and like helping each other and like it wasn't it was a communal thing you know yeah that's a good example yeah i uh, i have a, another example of that that i um that i guess only uh who was on here that could relate to this? Only Eliana, I guess. Oh, but not even, not even really Eliana. <laughs> but when shall have it close? Um, and uh, that was obviously a big, a big tragedy for everyone who was involved or who was involved. But the group of Lomdeha coming together, uh, both the students and the teachers, um, we we had something that was greater. We were preserving something of shall have it that was like greater than any individual one of us, that it wasn't just a like, like if it was just m like me losing my school and I had no like connection to any of the students or teachers, that would be like a tremendous loss. But the fact that we all got together to preserve, like to do what we could to like, like keep the fire going, so to speak, the flame burning, you know, uh, was, uh, was a huge uh, comfort that reduced the personal, uh, the personal uh, loss when it happened, yeah. Okay, so that that's one interpretation of the Malbim, which I think is really good. I had a slightly different interpretation of how it will help you on a Yom Evra. I can't figure out the um, the death part exactly, uh, unless you just say death is bad stuff. But if you, and, and this still feels like a Mishlaic uh, uh, cliche idea, but like if you let's just start with that though. If 
So if you have tremendous wealth, that'll help you in peacetime, but not in wartime, because then you get a, a target point and paint it on your back. But if you are someone who's a giving person, who's always giving to others, so then even on a day of wrath, people will want to help you because you've helped others. And I do think that even if you are wealthy, I think the fact that you have spent so much of your wealth helping others is not going to result in people just trying to like take your wealth. I think people will like, they'll recognize you as someone who is, uh, who does good with what they have. And the other thing is like this, is if you, the more tzedakah you do, I, I think there is a certain leadership quality in tzedakah. And I don't mean leadership quality in the sense of like, like having a, you know, a, a commanding presence or anything like that. I mean, like, like people who are Bali Tadaka are pillars of the community in, in what they do to support the community. And I think people will realize that even on a day of wrath, when everyone is suffering, then we need to let the person who is a Bali Tadaka be in charge of their, of how they use their wealth and we'll all benefit from it. There's going to be like a certain trust that they put in the person who's the Bal Sadaka to like do what's in the best interest of the community, because that's the, that is how they've established themselves as a, uh, in the community up until now. Whereas the guy who just has a lot of money, people might view him as the guy in the mansion on the hill, but no one really knows what his qualities are. So when everyone's losing money, they're just going to break down his door and take his stuff. Another example of this actually was, um, uh, I, I don't have my book on me uh, on hand where this happened, but you know, Marcus Aurelius was one of the greatest uh, philosopher kings, you know, whoever existed, and uh, and people knew that he was a philosopher king. And there was a time when there was, I think it was a famine, some big Yom Evra in Rome. So he went and uh, and he basically went through the palace, choosing all of like the royal treasures to sell to get money to like, like buy stuff to give to the, the people, you know? And like, you know, <laughs> I don't know if this has ever happened in history, but can you imagine like uh, those of you, especially who've watched like the crown, you know, um, uh, or, or who have watched other like British Royal stuff. Can you imagine like, like, you know, uh, <laughs> doing, you know, COVID and like people were losing jobs. Can you imagine like, like, I don't know, Queen Elizabeth going and like saying, let's just sell these Royal paintings to like other countries to raise enough money to like, get hospitals like no one I, to my knowledge britain none of the royal family in britain did that and like but can you imagine how like that would have been a, a hugely impactful thing but instead people just like resented the uh the royal family like they always do for like hoarding all of the uh the money and power um yeah all right i, I guess those are still not the most relatable examples but hopefully we got the idea there uh let me just see if there's one more idea and then we could summarize and call it a night um Oh, so I didn't know what to make of this one. This is Sadigon. Okay, so Sadigon is the one who said the day of judgment. So here's what he says. Kach nekra yom hadin, amru kikarav yom Hashem hagadol, yom evra hayom hahu. Okay, so that he quoted that Pasuk in Sfania that says it's the day of judgment. V'yesh shehat tzedakah matzila min hamavis ba'olam hazeh. There are acts of tzedakah that save from death in this world. Kamo hachayas hatzarf hatzarfis bishanos hara'av im Eliyahu. So this is like the uh, the woman excuse me, who saved um, uh, Eliyahu from starvation. Uh, and, uh, oh, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't do this one because we have to go through the, the whole story. Let me just see if, I could, if the story is short enough that I could read it. Uh, Malachim Aleph Yudzayin Tess. I don't think it's a long story. A yud zayin test. Okay, so it says like this. Um, so Eliyahu was being fed by. So Eliyahu fled from uh, uh, Ahav, I think, who and and Yizeva who were trying to kill him. And then there's a drought, and Eliyahu is being fed by the ravens. Okay, and it says uh, it happened at the end of a year that the brook dried up, for there was no rain in the land. The word of Hashem then came to him saying, "Arise and go to Tsarfas." Uh, of the territory of Sidon and settle there. Behold, I've commanded a widow to sustain you there. Um, when he says I commanded a widow, it doesn't mean that God spoke to the widow in Nebuah. He means that go there, I'll, I'll set it up for you. So he went and arose and went to Sarfas and arrived at the entrance to the city. Behold, a widow was gathering wood there. He called her and said, please fetch me some water in a vessel that I may drink. She went to get it and he called her saying, please fetch me also a piece of bread in your hand. She said, as Hashem, your God lives, 
I swear that I have not so much as a cookie, but only a handful of flour in a jug and a bit of oil in a cruise. Behold, I'm gathering two pieces of wood. Then I will go and prepare it for myself and my son. We will eat it and then we will die. But Eliyahu said to her, fear not, go do as you have said, but first prepare a small cake from it for me and bring it out to me and prepare for yourself and your son afterwards. For thus said Hashem, God of Israel, the jug of flour shall not run out and the flask of oil shall not lack until the day that Hashem provides rain upon the face of the earth. She went and did according to the word of Eliyahu and she ate, she and her household for a year. The jug of flour did not run out and the cruise of oil did not lack in accordance with the word of Hashem, which he had spoken through Eliyahu. So it seems like the, the, the implication of this thing here is that she was willing to do this, uh, this you know, initial act of tzedakah, of like giving him food to drink, or water to drink, even though it was a drought. And then when he, he said, you know, uh, can I eat? She said, I have to feed my, my, myself and my kid. But he said, don't worry, like, you know, this won't run out. So the Sadiqon seems to be learning this as though it was a, in merit of the fact that she sustained him, then, uh, then she was saved from death. And then he gives this weird example. And from the future punishment that is called death, as it says uh, by Yisro, when he invited Moshe to eat bread, the whole Kyotobo and other stuff like that. So I guess there's a midrash in, in the Gemara Sanhedrin that somehow Yisro was was like, I don't know if he was going to get punished or if it was just because he was Obed of Odazara, but as a result of welcoming Moshe in, then like that exposed Yisro to these ideas of uh, of Hashem and that like saved him in Olam Haba also. So I get the I get some sense from from Sadigon that um, well let me ask you, <laughs> do you get any like uh, direction from Sadigon here? I'll repeat what he said, just to review. He's saying there is a there are cases of Sadaka that save you from death in this world, like this widow who who sustained Eliyahu and then she got saved from like physical death in this world. And then there's cases where it saves you in Olam Haba, like uh this Yisro, uh, who was um uh, who invited Moshe to uh to eat, and then that led to like you know the whole Moshe marrying his daughter, and then Moshe uh, and then Yisro like like discovering Hashem. I mean I I do I do see what he's saying is just that um you know it's just like almost a, a chance you know, yeah yeah right you'll never know you know what may come out of it but he's just saying like like tzedakah is a good thing to do and you never know what may come out but it could help you out in the future right so i i do think that that i, that I got that same gist from him and and l- let's now work that into a, a peerish here because he's saying okay so so just to repeat he's saying basically like if you ask this woman like you know, could giving could giving this guy water to drink really save you from a drought for a year? She would have said, of course not, you know, but it ended up doing that. And same thing with Yisro, you know, are you going to, uh, you know, he was a priest of Avodah Zarah. Are you going to abandon, uh, you know, who, who could have foreseen that it was, that he was going to abandon his, his, uh, his religion uh, and like end up like, like having uh, the, the Derech Hashem. So, so Ariel's pointing out it's like a chance thing, but I think what the puzzle is pointing out is it's not just a chance thing. So can we explain it in a way like like mishleically? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's not a chance thing if you if you keep on doing tzedakah. Like I meaning you you just know like it'll come back to you. it's like mida can like mida. Like right. you know doing you know uh, tzedakah will help you in the future. You just don't know how it'll help you. Right. Um, hold yeah, on. So in that sense, it's perhaps. not a chance. It's more of like the circumstances chance. But yeah, you know, it's, I hear it's what you're saying. Yeah, what were you gonna yeah, say? I was just saying that I think it's more of like a natural consequence because we always believe that like Hashem set up the world in a way of Chachma. And I think right. that part of that is that when you do, and this is classic Mishli, when you do a positive action like tzedakah or like a righteous action, action, then you will be rewarded, you know, one way or another. And this is tying it, like I think it's much what Shipper was saying before, like this is tying it to death in whatever way. And Sadi going to saying in like sounds like more of like a Kares type way. Right. Or also death, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me combine both of those. Um, hold on here. Uh, for those who listen to my sheer on um, Kayan, this is going to be a repetition, but uh, there's just one Mi'iri I want to pull out of there. So this is Mi'iri on Mitzvah Guerrero's Mitzvah and Avera Guerrero's Avera, uh, and Schar Mitzvah Mitzvah and Schar Avera Avera. So he says, and we're not going to do the whole thing, uh, he says, um, so it means that one mitzvah will come from another mitzvah. 
Same thing with the, the reward of an Avera as an Avera that another Avera will come from it. And then classic Meiri, this is actually dovetails with Meiri I mentioned this morning, or not this morning, <laughs> at the beginning of this year. Um, mix up my Meshle Shirim here. So one mitzvah can come from another mitzvah through three ways, either by reward and punishment. Oh, same thing with the Vera, right? Either reward and punishment, where as a reward for doing a mitzvah, then God arranges it for you to get another mitzvah. And that's how reward and punishment works is, you know, the brochus and klalos are not here because getting rain in your time is the reward for doing mitzvahs. It's a facilitator that the whole brachos and klalos and the whole hashgacha pratis is the more you involve yourself in Torah and mitzvahs, the more God will facilitate your ability to be further involved in Torah and mitzvahs to get the real reward, which is the chachma here, which is going to benefit you in Olam Haba. Okay, that's gemul haonesh. Imitzada hergel, the other one is habit, is the more you get into the habit of doing uh, 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 you know, mitzvahs, the more you will create opportunities to, to do good that will bring further benefits to you. And then the last one is imlif ami mitzvah mikre, or by chance. And by chance, what he means is, my understanding of it is like, let's say you decide to go to, to um, uh, a, um, let's say you decide to go to Minion, okay? Or you go to Shul on Shabbos, let's say, right? And let's say like you weren't going to go, but you decided to go to Shul on Shabbos. And so you, you're there for the davening, but then as a result of being there for the davening, you end up hearing a Devar Torah that someone gives, and then that has an idea that changes your life. Or you meet up with a person who you haven't seen in a long time, and then that reestablishes a connection that ends up being beneficial for you in terms of your, your own like development, you know? So it's chance in the sense that, that you know, the purpose of going to shul is uh, is is to get the uh, to, uh, sorry of davening in a minion is the perfection you get of davening in the community. This had nothing to do with that, but by placing yourself in those circumstances, then uh, then it resulted in something good. He'll give an example for Avera, which illustrates it even more. The Efshar Shehan Nimshachas Mizoha Kala Tie Hamura. It's possible that a light mitzvah or light of air will lead to us a, a, a harsher one or, or, or a more weighty one. Kamo Shetomar, for example, Shabal Ligno, let's say you go to steal, to rob someone's house, Umatz o Bal Habayis, and the house owner finds you, Vagan of Yatris Konegdo, and then you, the thief, try to defend yourself, Vyakum Alava and you end up killing the, the house owner. So you went in to steal, but you ended up doing murder, you know? And same thing could be for a mitzvah, is you end up you know, going in to do, uh, to give tzedakah, and then you end up like, you know, uh, meeting someone who really needs help, and then you end up like getting into a relationship where you like, like care for them, and then ends up being this whole great thing that like saves a bunch of people. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I'm not going to read the rest of it. I'll just summarize it here. So the, uh, in the summary, the, uh, mitzvos and averis lead to each other through reward and punishment, through habit, or through chance, okay? So I think the same thing is true here with tzedakah, that the more you involve yourself in tzedakah, whether it is the act of giving tzedakah like charity or the act of seeking out opportunities to do righteousness. So God will provide you with, um, with uh, more opportunities for perfection. So that's like in the case of, or, or will, will, will benefit you. Like that's in the case of the widow and Eliyahu Navi or in habit or in chance. You know, oh, sorry, also with for Yisro. But in other words, even if God doesn't arrange it through for a specific Hashkacha practice, like with with the uh, with Yisro and with the widow, the more you're in the habit of doing this, the more you're going to become attached to Mishlaic acts of tzedakah or to to halachic acts of tzedakah, and the more you're going to be placing yourself in circumstances which lend themselves for this kind of benefit. So you're you're setting yourself up to to statistically avoid death. And I think death, Sadi Gon didn't say what death is, but, you know, uh, I mean, he said death in this world, death in the Lohaba, but I think you could use death as just gen generic Mishlaic uh, bad consequences or like um, like uh, the, the Targum says is like bad deaths, you know, the types of deaths that come about from like really bad consequences. Okay, I think that's good for tonight. Let's just quickly summarize here. So we had, I'd say two and a half approaches, okay? Uh, the half approach, which, which, which was the one that we developed through Avital in the beginning, which maybe kind of like was salvaged by Shifra, I don't know, let's try it and see, is um, that day of wrath and death really had to do with the way you relate to the bad stuff that happens to you. 
So if you are hoarding your money or the good that you could be doing, then the sole measure of good and bad and harm and benefit is what happens to me. And you're going to feel very victimized when, when, uh, when bad stuff happens to everyone and then you suffer. But if you are focused on helping the community, so then um, you are kind of like almost diffusing your identity into the community and, uh, and will will not suffer on a personal level from the stuff that happens to you on a day of wrath because the community is, 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 uh, is, is having benefit. The more I'm talking about this, the more I'm realizing maybe does it work better if we say day of wrath is the stuff that happens to you specifically. And we go with that interpretation, like the stuck in traffic idea that we had before. And like Sadaka gets you out of the personal framework and into the communal framework. That sounds like the idea we're saying for Avital. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm undecided which way to go. <laughs> Anyone want to weigh in? Sorry, what was your question? I'm stuck between Shifra's and Avital's uh, explanations. Avital's was really that both of them are in the individual framework. Um, and both of them are just like hyperbolic ways of, uh, of viewing what happens to you that increases your suffering. Like, like, oh, like God is mad at me or, uh, or like I'm dying. And, uh, and Sadaka helps you out of, uh, out of both of those. Um, How does it help you out? Because uh, well, that was the one thing we couldn't really answer for Avital's. Okay. And then Shifra was saying that, that the so, person, yeah. With mine, you, like, if you want that, whatever, I don't remember who it was that we read or whatever, like, before we read like if we switched it then it wouldn't really work with that that's true with this uh, the uh, malvum yeah yeah, yeah the malvum right okay so then let, let's just summarize the malvum and let's, let's see if we at least got that idea right? so the malvum said if you have a lot of money and you don't use it for tzedaka so then it'll help in in, a, in, in peacetime because no one's coming after you but then on a day of wrath then uh then Either it won't help you because you can't buy your way out of a out of a, a, a plague, or it'll make you into an active target. But if you give tzedakah, or you do tzedakah, so then we said that um, with Schiffer's idea, then it will um, it'll mitigate the personal suffering because you are really uh, identifying with the good of the community. Or according to the way we said it, like uh, like my, my practical spin on it is if you are a pillar of the community who does tzedakah, so then even on a day of wrath, people are not going to come after you. They are going to look towards you and kind of like put you in, a, in and you've established a track record of helping the community. So they're not going to turn against you on a day of wrath or they're not going to be as likely to turn against you. They'll really look for you. And since you naturally are aligned with tzedakah, you will not have that resistance and you will want to use all of your, uh, your money to like um, to help people. Yeah. That seems good. So what's the problem? I My problem is I really want to salvage Avital's uh, original interpretation. Mm -hmm. It appeals to the, the Stoic Jew podcast in me. But maybe we'll have to say that for, for some other time. Okay, well, at least we got ideas. Um, and uh, we what we did not do is we didn't really differentiate this from um, chapter 10 plus 2, nor did we really just tie this into the Tom and the Yashar. So I'm not like super upset about that. Like I think the I, the puzzle is going on its own, and part of me kind of fears going back into the Tom and the Usher. So I think maybe what we could do is like this. This would be a surer route, I think. Next week, uh, assuming that everything goes as planned and that there's no Yom Evra, then uh, we will be doing a puzzle about the Tom and the Usher. So when we do that, and it it and we either remember what we said about the Tom and the Usher or we refine it, then maybe we can go back to this pasuk and just plug in the Tom and the Asher and see if we get any ideas. So my, my idea didn't cut it for you? Oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot about your idea. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, your half idea, half idea, right? You didn't come up with a full idea, did you? I, I came up with a full idea. But you were trying to tie it into the Tom and the Asher, and I, I didn't understand that. Okay, fine. If you're going to, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a full idea. What, 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 what was the idea? Say, say your idea again. It, it was um, 
it was an overlap with I think Avital's idea, but I'm not exactly sure how it was an overlap in the end after you summarize it. But it had to do with the fact that if you're wealthy, um, you're just withholding your wealth and not giving it out. Um, mm -hmm. Versus tzedakah is you're having your wealth and you're giving it out, and that's ultimately what you know saves you because you know other people will you know, you know, treat you the same way in a time of need. Is that different than the Malbim's idea? Um, I guess not. No, I just didn't okay, want good. to good. So then you intuited the but... Malbim's idea. Yeah. Yeah. It just it confused me when you tried to tie it back into the Tom and the Yashar, but... Uh, yeah, that was just think... a separate point. That was just... Oh, okay. All right. So it works then. Okay. Good. All righty. Uh, okay. Let's call it quits for tonight. Uh, and... Uh, and I'm not, I, I, unless someone has something specific for after party purposes, uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a question that came up. Uh, okay, sure. Week. So let me, let's just officially end here. Uh, and you want, I'm going to, I'm going to turn off the recording also. All right. Yeah, you can turn it off. Um, so 